Hi, welcome to Entitled to Life, a podcast about healthcare, activism, policy, and politics. Um, I'm Paul Gibbs. And I'm Katie Drake. Um, we're your hosts for the show. And today, our guest is Ariel Malin. She is the program coordinator for the Transgender Health Program at University of Utah Health. Ariel, did I get that right? You did, yep. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're very happy to, to have you here. Um, as, as we were talking about, actually, before we started recording, this is, I think, a part of an aspect of healthcare that people like me in the cisgender community don't really think about as much as we probably should. We're not as aware of what we should, as we should be in that transgender health cares, uh, transgender issues in healthcare. So I'm really excited to, to have you on the show today and really glad that Katie thought of inviting you on the show. This is a, a great topic to be discussing, particularly coming in right at the end of Pride Month. We're really happy to have you here. So thank you for joining yeah. us. Today. Thank you so much and happy Pride Month, everybody. Yes. <laughs> So Ariel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I got to hear Ariel speak at a panel at work a while back and she did, she was just amazing and really got me thinking about a lot of these issues. Like Paul was saying that I as a cisgender woman don't have to worry about when I seek out healthcare. So um, Ariel, that was one of the things we wanted to start the conversation about is what challenges or barriers do members of the trans community face when it comes to accessing healthcare? Um, not just for, um, they're not just transgender healthcare uh, issues, but for healthcare in general. And um, what are some of the things that we as allies can do to help them access the care that they need? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a great question um, because um, research predominantly within um, LGBT experience has been pretty minimal for the most part, but we do have some to um, kind of share those stories. So disclosure up front, I also identify as cisgender. So when I talk about a lot of these issues, um, these are these are experiences that I have read about in research and literature. They're experiences that I've heard firsthand from uh, my partner who identifies as transgender and the community that I work with. Um, but just understanding that, you know, when I talk about these issues, this is coming from a privileged perspective of someone who identifies as cisgender. Um, so. Going back to your question about challenges or barriers, um, the research that's been conducted on healthcare experiences generally of LGBTQ plus folks has shown us that these communities as a whole are experiencing very high rates of discrimination in healthcare settings, among other settings. Mm -hmm. um, but with a special focus on our gender diverse communities, they face about two to three times more discrimination compared to their LGBT counterparts. And additionally, about 70% uh, of trans and gender diverse people have experienced more than one of the following. So I'm gonna read a little list. Um, they've been denied care because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, providers have used harsh or abusive language with them. Providers have refused to touch them or used excessive precautions. Um, providers have blamed them for their health status and providers have even been physically rough or abusive with um, our trans community. So this is kind of gives us a little bit of a highlight, a little bit of a picture of the majority of experiences across this community when accessing healthcare. Um, we also know that through research that minority stress tends to exacerbate experiences of discrimination. Um, and for those that are unfamiliar with minority stress, this is just referring to the additional stressors that are experienced by those of a minority group um, strictly based on their minority status. Um, so all of these barriers to care um, contribute to poor health outcomes and our community's likelihood of access and care when they actually need it, and especially during COVID right now. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention within this question too was that in addition to the discrimination based in healthcare settings, our trans communities also face higher rates of things like unemployment, um, mm -hmm. violence, and homicide even, yeah. and homelessness, and other situations that really affect their day-to-day -day lives. So when they're coming into a healthcare setting, you know, and they're misgendered, or someone uses their dead name, or any of those other experiences I just listed, that was not their first time having that happen to them. Um, it may just be the last straw. 
Um, so kind of maybe focusing on more on what we can do. Um, the improving access to gender affirming or LGBT competent care can look like a lot of things. Um, so from a maybe a macro level, healthcare, or healthcare organizations um, should be including these communities in their strategic plans so that resources can be allocated to system-wide efforts um, such as training frontline staff, targeting outreach of services, educating providers how to care for the community, um, as well as other things. Um, individual allies within healthcare spaces can make a difference by advocating within their own spaces um, to create affirming environments. So this can be um, asking for pronouns, sexual orientation, gender identity, and preferred name on their intake paperwork. This is, um, this shows that we're validating those identities within the community and it normalizes the conversation around collecting that information. Um, right now, not a lot of our systems are asking for all of these things. We're getting a little bit better about asking for preferred name and pronouns, um, but that, that does a lot for our trans community. Um, staff could also do things like wearing a, like a pronoun pin on their, on their uniform or their uh, smocks. Um, it could be a rainbow can, pin. Um, so, and the reason these, these small things make a difference is because we've actually seen in research as well that LGBTQ patients look for subtle cues in their physical environment to determine acceptance. So when they see something like that walking into a space, there's a sense of relief in knowing, okay, these people know me, they see me, and I'm safe here. Mm -hmm. That's kind of why we talk about those things. And then um, a couple of other things would be knowing what resources exist for the communities, um, because we are serving LGBT communities, whether we know it or not. Um, and in knowing that uh, you as an ally, you don't have to be the expert, and that's okay. But knowing a contact um, in order to give someone more information, um, also knowing our non-discrimination policies. Does it include sexual orientation and gender identity? Because if so, then we know that um, patients cannot be denied care or treated differently due to those identities. So that's helpful. Um, and then lastly, I know I'm kind of listing off a bulleted list here, but- That's okay, it's great. Yes. Great. So similar, similarly to our efforts around anti-racism right now, being able to amplify the voices of trans people and the organizations that are advocating for them. So locally, we have a lot of great organizations, um, the Utah Pride Center, Transgender Education Advocates, Gender Bands, the Transgender Health Program, all of these organizations that currently serve the community as their target audience. Um, this kind of allows for the right people to be able to do the work in reaching out to those communities. So um, there's a lot of overwhelming feelings, I think, being an ally sometimes and knowing, okay, where am I going to make the most impact? There's a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> applies to being an ally for any marginalized community. Um, so it's just kind of knowing, knowing what your options are to make that impact. I, um, as you were talking with that list, which was excellent, thank you so much for sharing that. There's lots of great ideas there. Um, I just wanted to share, I, I was at a panel uh, recently uh, and a, um, one of our gender studies professors at the University of Utah was speaking. And one of the things she talked about was, uh, you mentioned like forms and asking for uh, preferred names, preferred pronouns and things like that. And um, she was saying, you know, so many times in organizations, we get this idea that like, okay, we're going to change the form and we need 87 people to sign off on it and whatever. And it was like, you can just change the form. And so, um, you know, you can, there, there are little things like that that you can just do. So if you want to just add your pronouns to your email signature, like yes. you don't have to go through a whole organizational bureaucracy to do things like that. And um, I just thought that was so enlightening because I was like, oh my gosh, because I totally, if I was going to do something, I'd be like, we've got everyone to sign off on. And you feel really- All the committees. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, no, just change the form or just use the, um, the uh, non-gendered bathroom and make that normal or little things like that. that are so, uh, that I, again, come from that privileged position and never think of, but can make a really big difference for folks. So thank you so much for sharing those, those ideas with us. 
Yes, um, that, you know, that, that was really fascinating for me to hear. I had never thought about um, the use of pronouns in, in a medical setting like that, particularly it, with forms or anything like that. You know, I, um, as a kidney transplant patient, I have seen, prop, I think, 11 different kinds of specialists in the last 11 years. And so I've, I've been to a lot of doctors and a lot of doctor appointments, and I've never been given a form that asked me for my pronouns. And I can, I, I can really see how that would, seeking medical care can be an intimidating enough prospect for anyone. If you have that situation where you're, where you're not necessarily comfortable that you're going to be treated as your authentic self, I can see where that would be so much more intimidating. And I think back, actually the first, the first meeting I ever went to as a healthcare activist, we had a, a, a training session when, before we were going to be speaking the next day to a panel of legislators. And some of our coaching was done by, I, I'm drawing a blank on whether it was people from the Pride Center from Equality Utah, but I, I was very grateful for that opportunity and they really taught me a lot. But as I look back, I remember as we were introducing ourselves, they had us ask for, they asked, they asked us for our preferred pronouns. And that was, that was a new experience for me at the time. I'd never been asked that before. And my answer was that I just didn't really care what my pronoun was. And at the time, I was actually trying to be, I felt like I was trying to be accepting with that to say, whatever is good, I, you know, be whoever you want. But I, I now kind of, I, with, I have a much deeper understanding of what those pronouns mean to people now. And I wish that I had been more overtly supportive of that process of the importance of the pronouns. And so I think that there are, like you said, there are a lot of little things that we can do as allies to, to try to be better allies. And we can be overwhelmed, but we need to keep trying as hard as we can. Yeah, definitely. And it does seem like there's a lot of these options that, um, th that normalization is a big part of that. Is that what you would say, Ariel, is just, is just making it like, now when you introduce someone, you say, hi, I'm Katie, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And you just make it like, a part of what we do. And, and it seems like that really helps um, members of, of these underserved communities a lot to make it more, because if we're seeing it and it's normal for us, then it's normal for them too. So Exactly. And that, uh, that's what a lot of the best practice institutions are really recommending at this time too. And um, I think we're, we're at a time where it's really nice that we have these best practices already kind of established and showing us the way on how to make a more affirming environment. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely out there and we have very clear recommendations on how to make things better. And I'm glad that, you know, there's less hoops to jump through for some of those things. And, um, you know, one of the things we're working on at the University of Utah is um, our electronic medical record includes all of these fields, preferred name, pronouns, sexual orientation, gender identity, but we haven't been using them and our staff doesn't know where they are. So we as a system need to start doing some training around like, okay, well, let's show you where those fields are, how to, um, you know, correctly ask for that information. Um, we, we also talked about different things like putting out, you know, brochures in the clinics to talk about why we ask for that information. Because I think for a lot of LGBT folks coming and having those questions asked of them, I think that is a relief for them to be asked about their identity and knowing that that's going to be taken into, into account for their medical care. Um, but for a lot of um, cis um, heterosexual people that maybe have never even thought about those things before, they're like, why are you asking me that? So having that patient education to be like, well, we ask, we ask all of our patients Everybody. this, we're singled out, this is relevant to your care. Um, and then they can have that conversation additionally with their provider too, but we start the conversation um, with that frontline medical staff to kind of normalize, like you're saying. Great. 
Well, so I want to I want to take the conversation to somewhere that we've um, been hearing a lot about lately, where um, there's been some loss of protections for trans folks and the LGBTQ plus community under the Affordable Care Act. So, um, can you talk to us a little bit, Ariel, about you know what that means for patients and caregivers and and what exactly has been lost? And I think there's a lot of rumors around this and things like that. So can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I, I do not have a legal background at all, um, but this is, you know, based on some of the research that I've done and, and some people that I've talked to that are in those spaces. So the, the, the federal ruling that was announced in early June, ultimately, um, if it is passed, so we have about 60 days from when it was announced on whether or not it'll be passed, um, we'll give healthcare workers and health plans the right to deny care to trans and queer people for religious reasons. So that's ultimately what it's um, giving permission to do. Okay. And um, understandably, the community is really scared right now. Um, yeah. A lot of calls into our program and others that I've talked to and they don't know if the care that they've been receiving will be taken away from them um, and where they'll go if that even happens because trans health care is definitely hard to come by already mm -hmm. um, and this intensifies an already overwhelming problem of gender diverse people being afraid to access care in the first place sure. and denied care mm -hmm. so, and then additionally we have this pandemic going on so you know these communities may not feel safe to go get tested or get access to healthcare if they do contract the virus, which means, you know, as we know, the COVID cases are surging right now and, you know, people are having to go to the hospital for their care because it can get intense. And um, trans and gender diverse people are uh, people that are working in those frontline positions in retail stores and grocery stores. And, um, you know, so it's, it's definitely not great. <laughs> um, but thankfully, I think there is a little bit of hope. Um, there are advocates who believe that the recent Supreme Court ruling protecting LGBTQ plus workers from employment discrimination on the basis of sex could be, that same language could be applied to protections in healthcare, education, housing, and other areas that we've kind of been fighting. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is hopeful that as, as organizations as organizations, we can also uh, fall back on our, our non-discrimination policies to guide behaviors and protocols that we expect out of employees. So at the university, our non-discrimination policy does include um, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. So even if this federal ruling passed, um, it would be very difficult for healthcare workers to use that as a reason to deny care. Um, but because of that fear, we've also made very um, uh, very strong statements out to the community on our social media platforms and on our website to tell them that we're continuing continuing to be committed to their care and that will not go away. That's that's just devastating and oh terrible. my gosh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I, thinking about that, being a religious person. Myself, I, I just cannot even wrap my head around the idea of it, of anybody feeling that it was in, within their moral belief system to, to deny somebody health care because of their gender identity. And it's, it's very upsetting to me that this is being approached in this way. I just don't get it. And it's... I think it's important to know that not all trans and gender diverse people are coming to healthcare settings to medically transition like that yeah one of the things that they seek services for but trans people get broken legs they get colds yeah. just like everybody else so well, it's, especially you know, if they're at more risk for some of these things like violence and yeah. homelessness and things like that they're going to have more medical needs that way so that's an excellent point yeah they're they're coming for the regular health care that all of us want as well and, and yeah the thought of denying someone cares again i i'm not a religious scholar like paul but it seems like all the religions say if someone needs help you should help them so that's, that yeah, I, I seems like a basic tenant to me but absolutely hey, that's what's great about this podcast is we can have our our uh bias shown through so <laughs> yeah. um, 
So um, you brought up something, Ariel, here just a minute ago that I think we, I would love to touch on is this idea of the gender binary. And I feel like we've been caught in that for so long as yes. uh, a society. But if you look back in ancient civilization, this is, has not always been the case, right? And um, so can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what do you wish people knew that um, about folks who don't fit into that binary definition and, and maybe aren't seeking, you know, gender reassignment surgery or things like that? And how can we support them? Yeah, so I definitely, I, I kind of went back and forth on this question on how to approach it. Part of me wanted to go explain it from the scientific end and say, you know, uh, kind of dive into the fact that male and female are actually not the only uh, sexes that we have biologically. Right. <laughs> um, and gender is not the same thing. But I kind of want to approach it from more of a more of an authenticity angle. Mm -hmm. uh, so allowing people to live authentically in their gender expression and identity has never actually affected society negatively. Mm -hmm. um, but because society is so reliant on binary representations of men and women in every aspect of life from bathrooms to gender roles, clothing, body language, literally everything in our lives yeah. are, are separated into these binaries. Um, they haven't been taught that a spectrum actually exists within gender expression and gender identity in itself, that you, you can have an internal sense of gender that is different than the sex that you were assigned at birth. Or, you know, maybe it is the same, but it's expressed a little bit differently. So under that gender is such a spectrum of experience and doesn't just exist in these two categories is I think the biggest thing. Um, but by forcing someone to live in an assigned binary, you have taken away their authenticity and their uniqueness as a human being. So, you know, and, and this isn't to say that binary representations of gender are bad or even wrong. Um, I'm cisgender. I enjoy identifying as a female and expressing very feminine. We have a lot of our trans folks who are transitioning to a binary representation because that's what feels authentic to them. And that is absolutely wonderful and perfect. But it's to say that there's more and mm -hmm. people deserve to identify and express themselves in a way that's true to them. And it's not really up to us as, you know, uh, the political leaders, healthcare leaders, society to really tell them otherwise because gender identity and gender expression is an internal sense mm -hmm. of who a person is. That's beautifully said. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I, I, you know, as this is, this is a concept that I've really, that's really been new to me within about the past five or six years that I've really become more aware of this. And since then, I, I've had a friend come out as as non-binary and that has I think with all of these LGBT is, issues for those of us who are cisgender and grew up not necessarily in uh, an environment that was accepting of this uh, of these differences that it makes a big difference when we get to know and care about an individual who is is LGBT that it it, it challenges our perceptions when we, when somebody we know fits into these categories and hopefully makes us realize that everybody who does is a person just like this individual that we care about. And I, I know a lot of people are, are really resistant to things like using pronouns or whatever, but you know, whatever your beliefs are, I think to me, the one thing that is absolutely clear is that if you're calling somebody what they don't want to be called, the very clear definition for that is jackass. And just, <laughs> it doesn't hurt you to, to accept people as they are and, and treat them as the person that, that they are. Just call somebody what Absolutely. they identify as. That's yeah, very true, very true. And I think there's, it, it's hard. I mean, we, it seems like we're, we are all cisgender identified people on the, on this call right now. So yeah. 
what's hard to know what are what are those experiences really like how does that really impact someone's life um i feel like um media does a really good job well they haven't predominantly historically trans people have not been represented well in media no. but there are a lot of more recent um media representations that have depicted that experience well and i feel like media is, is a way for people to connect to people that they maybe maybe they've never met a trans person so they have no idea what that is even like but being able to see someone on screen and you can relate to their life in a way um it, i i feel like it it gives us that ability to empathize and connect and and not not pity the, the the trans community, the LGBT community doesn't want pity. We want, um, we want acceptance, understanding, mm -hmm. um, and also just recognition of the history that, you know, the fact that we had to have a Supreme Court ruling to say that y'all can't discriminate against us in employment settings, like, <laughs> we're, <laughs> yeah, we've still got stuff to do. Marriage yeah. did not end all of the, all of the, the things that we needed to fight for. So it's, I, I guess going back to media representation is sometimes helpful when we don't have that um, actual representation in our life where we don't know someone. So. Sure. Absolutely. You know, I, 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 that just made me think about how you said that media representation has historically not been very positive. I remember just a few years ago um, watching a movie on Netflix that was a, a movie that had come out in the early 90s called Soap Dish. I thought, oh, I, I've never seen this. So I, I wanted to see it. And I watched it and it relied on a very old trope of portraying a transgender character for shock value. At, and I found myself thinking, you know, what? if I had seen this when, I, when it came out, I would have not found this offensive. I wouldn't have been shocked by it. That was what was normal in media. But now it was, whoa, this is really creepy and not okay to, to kind of make this person treat, treat her as a joke or as the villain somehow because she was transgender. And it really, I look at that compared to some of the media representations I see today. And we definitely have come a long way on how, how transgender people are represented. And I think that's entirely a good thing. Yeah. I overall just I feel like the overall message I'm getting from you Ariel with all of this is just empathy is that that's the biggest thing that we as allies can have is just um, trying to put aside our privileged position sometime and and thinking of ways and of, of putting ourselves in other people's shoes and trying to to give them not our pity but our empathy and and trying to make things comfortable is that a good a good take <laughs> Absolutely. And, and education, because it's, you know, similar to, you know, the, the racial communities that we're trying to advocate for right now, um, educating ourselves on what this community has predominantly faced in history and maybe why they're a little bit upset at the current situation. Sure. You know, having that background is helpful. And then, you know, um, I think being an ally is is really just about listening to experiences, believing them when they share those experiences, and advocating by their side rather than for them. Sure. So, you know, within that context. So last thing I just uh, will ask to wrap up, um, kind of going back to this idea of, you know, what can we as activists and as allies do to help trans folks get the care that they need? What can we do both on a personal level, but are there, you know, bills that we need to be lobbying for or things like, you know, how can we help in that way? Yeah, um, in regards to bills, I don't have anything specific in mind, but Equality Utah does a great job about kind of following what's impacting our community. And they put out a lot of information on like, you know, hey, these are the candidates that we know are going to back our community up if they get in office so they um they do a great job about that i think being an ally allies can make a huge impact even in just the spaces they frequent like their own workplaces and starting dialogue with friends and family so if your organization doesn't already participate in pride or have an employee resource group or lgbt people start one amplify those voices that are impacted 
take a look at your uh, workplace policies. Do they have a policy for trans folks transitioning in the workplace? Does your employer health care insurance cover transgender benefits? You know, look at your non-discrimination policy. Do, does your workplace provide annual diversity training? And if so, does that include LGBT people and those experiences? So um, I think we can, we as allies, we don't have to spread ourselves out into every area, but even just the areas that we are, um, we are frequenting the most. Sure. Awesome. Well, I think that, I think that wraps, wraps up our time for today. Again, thank you so much for joining us and for advocating for the LGBTQ community. We really appreciate that and hope that this can help some people understand these issues better if they haven't understood them before or if they're experiencing these issues, hopefully feel validated that there are people out there on their sides. Yeah, so, yeah we see you. We see you and we love you. Yes, we do. So Thanks. I just want to give a shout out too to, um, you know, it's Pride Month, but Pride was started by Black trans women at Stonewall. So shout out to them for, for all that they've done for us and um, yes. uh, as allies, as members of the community, and just as family. Oh, yeah, and Ariel's holding up her Black, yes. Black Trans Lives Matter sign, which is so true. So, um, yeah. Ariel, what, um, do you have any resources that you want to share if folks are interested in your program? How should they get in touch with you? Um, they can visit our website, um, uofuhealth.org slash transhealth. Um, they, it, so that you can see our services there. If there's, um, you know, more education people are interested, the LGBT health education, um, online, just Google it. They have a bunch of webinars, resources. They offer CEUs. Um, if you're someone that's working with this population and they need resources, um, uh, the Utah Pride Center has a lot of mental health programming as well as peer-to-peer uh, -peer social support programming. Um, and I'm happy to send links to a couple of things if that's relevant too. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for that information. Uh, thank you all, all of you who are listening for joining us today. We hope you'll come back again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.